Hello friends, during my last lecture I started discussing free energy diagram for oxides which are also known as Eligram diagrams. Let me quickly recapitulate some of the basic features of Eligram diagrams. These diagrams plot standard free energy of formation of various oxides from the metal and oxygen as a function of temperature and the values are always with reference to one molecule of oxygen. So, all the formation reactions are so written that it is always one molecule of oxygen in the reaction and there is a very interesting reason why we do that. We do that because then we can easily deduct values of formation of one oxide from values of formation of another oxide. We can calculate very easily the free energy change in the reaction when one metal reduces a lesser, less uh, stable oxide to produce a more stable oxide. I will give an example of that. But first of all, let us see the relevance of this, these diagrams for carbon reduction of oxides, which as you know is the basic reaction in pyrometallurgy. Now, carbon forms two oxides, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. The line for carbon reacting with oxygen to form CO2 is a horizontal line because there is no entropy change in this reaction. The same number of moles of gas are involved in the left hand side as well as the right hand side. One mole of oxygen giving you one mole of CO2 and as I mentioned earlier these lines represent the equation delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So, the slope is comes from delta S naught which is the entropy change. In the case of CO reaction however, 2, 2 C plus O 2 giving you 2 CO, we have the situation that 1 mole of oxygen reacts with carbon to produce 2 moles of CO. So, the volume is increasing volume of gas, the entropy is increasing and therefore, this line has a negative slope. This implies that with increasing temperature, carbon monoxide becomes increasingly stable. Carbon dioxide stability does not change with increasing temperature. On the other hand, all oxides which are represented by the parallel lines show that as the temperature increases, all oxides become less stable, more prone to reduction and decomposition. Now, these lines intersect, carbon cuts these lines as well as uh, for formation of CO cuts this, CO2 cuts these lines as well as carbon going to carbon dioxide also cut these lines. Consider an intersection of this line and that line. This oxide is becoming increasingly unstable with temperature and CO is becoming increasingly stable with temperature. Beyond this intersection, CO is comparatively more stable than the oxide. There, therefore, carbon can reduce this oxide to form CO and liberate that metal. Now, since the CO line has a negative slope. In theory, it will cut all lines. Of course, some intersections will be at a very high temperature, some would be at low temperatures. So, those oxides which are not very stable will be reduced easily. Oxides that are far more stable will be reduced at high temperatures. In theory, it is quite possible that the temperatures required for reduction at for these metals at such high temperatures, what will be more stable 
some carbide will become more stable and not oxide because the metal would also react with carbon in the system. Then you have a different kind of problem. But in theory, carbon, oxygen to form carbon monoxide, this reaction can be the basis of reduction of any metal oxide at sufficiently high temperatures. How do we calculate the uh, thermodynamic quantities, free energies of formation such reactions for such reactions? It is very simple actually. Consider the basic reactions here. 2 C plus O 2, 2 C O call it delta G 1, C plus O 2, C O T call it delta G 2 and formation reactions for oxide, a simple oxide MO, we take delta G, G 3. If you write it in the reverse manner, this becomes minus delta G. Now, you have to add this reaction with this reaction to get the values for these like 2 M O plus 2 C to give you 2 M plus 2 C O will be obtained by delta G naught 1 minus delta G naught 3 and for 2 M O plus C giving you 2 M plus C O 2 will be given by delta G naught 2 minus delta G naught 3. So, you can calculate the free energy change for the reduction of uh, these reduction reactions by carbon to form CO and CO2. These calculations are important in metallurgy and there will be many examples of that. Similarly, we can calculate the free energy change when a metal M prime reduces a less stable metal oxide to produce release that metal and produce a more stable metal oxide again by uh, taking a difference of two uh, free energy change for two reactions. Now, another thing that I had mentioned is that in these plots the slope represents delta S naught. The change in slope is not because of change in delta S naught, but because of some melting of either metal or the uh, metal oxide. Now, let us take this example of reduction of Al 2 O 3 by carbon. So, we have to combine these two reactions 2 C plus O 2 2 C O and 4 by 3 aluminum plus O 2, 2 by 3 L 2 O 3. You have to deduct the free energy values for this reaction from the free energy change for the reaction and then we get the desired reaction 2 by 3 L 2 O 3 plus 2 C, 4 by 3 L plus 2 C O and we can calculate the free energy change for that reaction. You can see here that the carbon going C O that line is represented approximately by this line. Carbon oxygen reaction to form CO2 is about this line. This intersection takes place at around 710 and for iron oxide the line is here. So, we can say that FeO can be reduced by both carbon, carbon to form either CO2 or CO at around here, but the line for Al 2 O 3 can be met only by the line for C O. This line that represents carbon oxygen reaction to form C O 2 does not cut this Al 2 O 3 line. We can say that if we can have temperatures of around 1800 degrees, even a stable oxide like Al 2 O 3 will be reduced by carbon to form C O, because beyond this point C O becomes more stable as compared to Al 2 O 3. However, as I mentioned, although this is ok in theory, we cannot ignore another reaction that will take place that will form aluminum carbide. 
which will not be reduced by C A. So, this reaction actually is it cannot be exploited in the industry, but for lesser uh, less stable oxides where these lines are placed higher above we will find many reactions many reactions are possible uh, where uh, the reduction is by carbon. There is another thing that happens that suppose there is a metal oxide which is reduced by carbon to form metal and carbon monoxide. Suppose the temperature is very high, we can help the re reaction in two ways. We can apply vacuum, if we can apply vacuum and release C O from the system, then this reaction will be driven to the right and it can take place at lower temperature. The other way would be if you can lower the activity of M by dissolving in something. For example, suppose we produce not the metal, but a ferro alloy, a metal dissolved in a pool of iron, then the activity of metal will go down and the reaction will be driven to the right, we will be able to carry out the reaction at a lower temperature, we will also eliminate if not totally partially the tendency to form a carbide, because again formation of a carbide will depend on activity of the metal. So, in the case of those oxides which are very stable and which will need very high temperatures for reduction by carbon we can help the reduction reaction by using by producing ferro alloys. This is the basis of production of ferrochromium, ferromanganese, ferrovanadium etcetera, which are possible because the metal being produced is being dissolved in iron and we can drive the reaction to the right. Unfortunately, we do not produce anything called ferro aluminum. Otherwise, if we could dissolve aluminum in iron, then this reaction would have occurred at a much lower temperatures, because aluminum uh, activity uh, will go down. Okay, let us now proceed. <coughs> the Thermodynamics uh, has been extensively applied in the case of roasting reactions also to understand the reaction. Now, during roasting, all kinds of reactions are possible. I am writing some reactions here, as you can see. Let us assume the sulphide is written as MS2, like FeS2 it can react with other sulphides like FeS, release sulphur, the sulphur oxygen reaction is possible, the metal sulphide can react with oxygen to produce a metal oxide and SO2, there is reaction between SO2 and there should be half O2, oxide and SO3 can form uh, MO4, then there are also this sort of products are possible. In other words, when you have a system in a system you have metal, sulphur and oxygen, you can produce oxide, you can produce different sulphides, you can produce sulphates, you can produce uh, compounds which can be written as a combination of oxide and sulphate. What will exist at a particular temperature will depend on the partial pressures of sulphur and oxygen or if you fix the pressures of sulphur and oxygen, then what will exist, what phases will be present will depend on the temperature. This information is vital and necessary, because if you want to control roasting reactions, 
we would like to aim at certain products, we must know what should be the value of partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of um, sulfur and what should be the temperature. So, let us see how we do that. There are Ellingham diagrams for sulphides also, where all the reactions are sh shown for formation of the sulphides for reactions between the metal and sulphur, always written as H2, su sulphur vapor. So, all the reactions as in, in the case of oxides, it was with O2, it is written in terms of H2, and whatever we did with sulphides. Uh, oxides, we can do the same thing here, but we do not consider these diagrams for reduction by carbon or not even so much for metallothermic reaction, but there are other uses of these diagrams and I will I'll, I'll try to show you one or two uses. People have been able to draw using thermodynamic data diagrams called predominance area diagrams. Now, predominance area diagrams show us that at a particular temperature for different values of PO2 and PSO2, what are the phases that are present? This will be for a particular temperature which means that we can have this phase for a variety of combinations of partial pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of, of SO2. There are limits, but if you have the partial pressure of oxygen at this and if you exceed the value of P SO2 beyond this, then you will end up with S in NiSO4. So, how do we draw such diagrams? I will give you a, a, an example of a simple example that suppose you want to study the uh, NIS, this diagram of roasting of NIS with there are many, many reactions possible. Let us consider one particular reaction that is nickel sulphide giving you NiO and SO2. Now, we know that the basic reaction for this would be delta G naught minus R T L n K prime, where K prime is the equilibrium constant, which is written like this. Now, from this, if we take log, we can write log P S O 2, 3 by 2 log P sub O 2 plus log K prime. We are considering an equilibrium between NIS and NIO and that is the line B C, NIS and NIO. Now, similarly for reaction Ni 3 S 2, 7 by 2 O 2, 3 NIO 2 S O 2, we will obtain another equation. Now, how do you analyze these? Look at this, uh, look at these two equations 2 n i plus O 2, 2 n i o. From Ellingham diagrams, we can get the free energy change value for this. 2 n i plus S 2, 2 n i s, we can get the free energy change for this from the Ellingham diagram from sulphides. Now, you write it in the reverse this reaction, so that you can add these two equations to get equation that represents oxidation of NIS to NIO. So, we can get the delta G naught value for this reaction 2 NIS plus O 2 plus 2 NIO considering the free energies of formation of the oxide and sulphur. From this the delta G naught value for this has some value, this will have another value these values are also available. So, if you subtract 
this value from that value, we will get the delta G naught for this reaction 2 N i s plus 3 by O 2, 2 N i o plus 2 S i o 2 and finally, if you have it, we will get the delta G naught value for this. Now, if you have the delta G naught value for this, then we can do the, we can get the value of k, because delta G naught is equal to minus R T ln k prime and once we have that value of k prime, if we substitute there, then we get an equation that relates P S O 2 with log P O 2 for a particular temperature. For different values of T, we will get different relationships and in using that, we can draw the boundaries between N I S and N I O. Similarly, we have to consider the various equilibria and we can draw these lines. Now, obviously, if we consider the equilibrium between nickel and nickel oxide, it will depend only on P O 2, it has nothing to do with SO 2 uh, at all, that is why this is a vertical line. Similarly, N I S and N I S O 4 would also the boundary also would be a vertical line. We have also this sort of uh, phase stability diagrams or predominance area diagrams for other oxides, sulphates and sulphides. This is a very, very important diagram, because we need to know that when we take uh, lead sulphide and we roast it to get PBO, where should the op furnace operate? Normally, this is the um, range where the usual roaster gas composition is usually here. Now, you know this sort of calculations gives us the limiting value, that this is the equilibrium value. Obviously, if suppose you get a equilibrium temperature of T, the actual operation in the industry would be high, higher temperatures for various reasons. Firstly, to accelerate the rates or sometimes to melt different phases, but we still want to know the limiting values that will tell us exactly where the operation should be carried out. Now, let us go back to some um, things I mentioned earlier. I had talked about roasting. Roasting is you take a sulphide and you convert it into an oxide or a sulphate or whatever it is. There are so many reactions. This is a roaster which is very commonly used to very commonly used in the industry called hearth roaster. Here there are many, many hearths and the there is a central shaft on which these hearths are circular hearths and the whole thing rotates. The, the, the hearths rotate and the feed from the top actually goes from one hearth to another in this fashion and see these are the teeth which sort of go through the charge. So, the charge flows from one to the other, one to the other, one is stationary, this part is stationary, these are the uh, attached to the center shaft which are rotating and they, these are the teeth, the teeth kind of uh, make the charge flow from one to the other. So, the by the time the sulphide has come from here to the bottom, you get a calcine, you got the oxide. Now, lot of experiments on this showed that actual roasting reactions took place when the particles are falling from one hearth to the other in mid air by people had taken samples, not so much as when they were on, on the hearth and they were being stirred or they were they are going from one place to another. So, that gave an idea uh, of this flash roaster, which is what is used in the industry now. There the idea is that finely divided sulphide concentrate and air is allowed to drop through a combustion chamber maintained at a certain temperature and this is a discharging device you get the roast straight away. What will be the nature of the product will depend on of course, the partial pressure of oxygen 
and of temperature etcetera etcetera but this is a very rapid process that the multiple hearth roaster will take very long time because the central shaft is rotating and the charge is coming very slowly from top to the bottom but here it is practically almost instant instantaneous of course there is a height of the chamber they simply drop through a hot chamber and immediately roasted and they are taken out now this gave rise to another idea to which I would come that for that I have to come to the concept of smelting now I had mentioned in roasting there is no melting you are charging you are hitting a solid charge sulfide and it becomes a solid oxide but in the system if you bring in a reducing agent like carbon and some fluxing agents like calcium oxide and um, quartz you create a slag phase that operation is called melting where you create like in blast furnace you create slag and you create metal and there is separation between one and the other we have smelting in case of sulfide ores also but sulfides do not give metal straight away what they do is a phase called mat and we have an operation called smelting where the sulfides are first partly roasted and then the whole charge reduced there is a slag phase and we do have a separation of slag from the metallic values but the metallic values stay basically as a mixture of sulfides in the case of copper iron sulfide and copper sulfide we call that matte so there is matte slag separation so smelting can be of two kinds metal slag separation or matte slag separation this I will discuss in detail in the when we come to extraction of copper now this idea of flash smelting has come a uh, flash roasting has come into flash smelting also there the idea is the sulfide is particles are dropped into a chamber hot chamber controlled you know, oxygen partial pressure along with the fluxing material and there is auxiliary fuel and oxygen to maintain temperature so while in flight and then later on it not only produces the calcine but calcine also reacts with reducing agents and you end up with a slag and mat so this is also a very rapid process flash melt flash roasting is where there is no reducing agent you are simply calcining it very quickly and flash smelting is where in a flash you are calcining then you are also fluxing out and the gang and you are producing a slag and a mat two separate phases now I have been talking about this word slag quite frequently so I would like to say a few words about what is slag and how is slag made but before that let me give you one or two small examples of how thermodynamic calculations are applied in the case of reduction reactions now here is a small problem find the vacuum required to reduce nb2o5 by carbon at 1200 degree k now if you look at the Ellingham diagrams this reaction reduction of NB2O5 by carbon will need very high temperatures because if you write in this reaction NB2O5 to C this normally if you look at the Ellingham diagrams where we are we are plotting standard free energies it is for a given values of partial pressure of CO it will need high temperatures but this reaction obviously can be sent forward if you find ways to reduce this carbon monoxide by applying vacuum so the problem is this can we reduce NB203 205 by carbon at a relatively low temperature of 1200 degree K which is 900 degree centigrade normally it will not happen 
But suppose we apply vacuum, what kind of vacuum would we need? It is very easy. We have the free energy change values for this reaction, standard free energy change. We have the standard free energy change for formation of N B 2 O 5. By difference, we get the standard free energy change for the reaction that we are studying, which is reduction of N B 2 O 5 by carbon to form metal and C O at 1200 degrees K we will get the value of delta G naught as 68.85 kilocalories, which is minus R T L and K, K is the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant we can obtain by putting the right values 68.85 R T value and taking 2.303 log K if we write, it comes to 4.575 in 1200 k is represented by this expression and so we end up with an expression from which we can calculate that the equilibrium partial pressure of carbon monoxide would be 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 atmosphere for this reaction. Now, obviously, which is equal to 2.28 uh, millimeter Hg, this is the equilibrium partial pressure of C O for this reduction reaction. So, if we can maintain a vacuum better than 2.28 millimeter mercury, then we can make this reaction happen at temperatures as low as 900 degrees. We use thermodynamic data for analysis of thermit reactions, which refer to reduction of an oxide by another metal like right in the beginning I had said there is a process called thermit process, where F E 2 O 3 is reduced by aluminum exothermically to produce liquid iron. All it needs is you take F E 2 O 3 powder and aluminum powder and ignite, immediately the reaction starts, the temperature is so high that everything becomes molten, even L 2 O 3 becomes molten and the molten iron will go into the cracks in rails if you want to uh, repair those rails. Now, in these cases as I have shown here after initiation temperature rises melt rises enormously to melt everything. L 2 O 3 can be easily slacked off means if you put some flux it will it will go out very easily and the rest are not volatile. So, the reaction is easy, but sometimes even such reactions are ok in theory there are a lot of problems in practice. For example, suppose you want to reduce T i O 2 solid by calcium. This reduction re needs high temperatures where calcium becomes a gas. So, the reaction has to be written like this. It has to be in, in a closed chamber titanium dioxide being reduced by calcium vapors to produce C O which is solid which can be slagged off and titanium which is solid. Now, titanium melts at 1670 degrees, calcium boils at 1492 degrees centigrade, calcium melts only at 2600. So, it is a very complicated reaction because we are not able to get liquid phases very easily. So, thermodynamics gives us guidance about what should be the temperature, uh, etcetera, etcetera, but then in practice we need to do a lot more things. This we would can discuss only when we come to uh, extraction of individual metals. Now, before we before I end this lecture, I want to say something about structure of slags. Generally in an ore, we have metallic values means minerals and we have gang. Gang means things we do not want like silica, alumino silicates, many other things. Now, when we do smelting by say by the reducing agent and we add a flux, the flux is limestone, quartz etcetera. The whole idea is to produce a liquid 
silicate phase, which takes out many impurities, which separates it out from the metal, and so that we have a clean separation between slag and metal. How do we create a fluid slag? To that, we have to go into a bit of discussion of silicate structures. Pure silica, SiO2, although it is written like this, it is not made up of molecules of SiO2. Silicon actually is bonded to four oxygen atoms. This is the basic unit and many such units attach themselves to one another like this. So, in SiO2, there are these tetrahedral things attached to each other, so that the entire mass is actually one molecule in theory. And that is why molten silica is very viscous, because it, it is the flow unit is very large. Of course, if one raises the temperature too high, then many of these bonds will break thermally. So, we make smaller and smaller flow units. But there is a very clever way we can make silica less viscous. And this is, if let us represent the basic silica structure by two dimension, in two dimensional manner, these are oxygen atoms. If we add to this silica, which is an acid oxide, a basic oxide like calcium oxide, which gives calcium. This oxygen goes and breaks a silicon oxygen bond. So, it splits. We from a big flow unit, we create two smaller flow units and then it becomes less viscous. So, we can represent the reaction in a, in a thing like this. This will happen with metal oxide you have added. We have broken it into and the metal ion is hanging around. Now, in silica, the more calcium oxide you add, the more fluid it becomes, because the more bonds are broken the flow units become smaller and smaller and smaller, but there is a limit to that. This, once you have broken it down to the smallest unit, which is Si you cannot break it any further. So, we have a long chain or a complicated thing, you keep on breaking and finally, this is the smallest unit and this happened when two thirds calcium oxide and there is one third SiO2. It is very easy to understand why this is so, because from stoichiometric reasons, if you have added sufficient amount of um, oxygen, SiO2 has to um, go down to the smallest unit. Now, the lot of work has been done on structure of silicates and it is a very vast subject, I do not want to go into that, but you should understand that there is a concept of acidity and basicity in slags. Acid slags are where silica is on the higher side, basic slags are where calcium oxide is on the higher side. Why this is a base? This is called a base because it donates oxygen ion. It donates oxygen ion. It is called an acid oxide 
because it accepts oxygen ion for breaking into smaller and smaller units. Do not think only calcium oxide is the basic oxide. FeO, CaO, MgO, they are all basic oxides. Al2O3, we call it is an amphoteric oxide. It sometimes it acts as a base that it donates oxygen ions, sometimes it acts as an acid, it adds oxygen, depending on the composition. It will be enough for you to know that if the slag is viscous, its flow units are large because there are polymeric silicon oxygen units in that. It can be made fluid by adding basic oxides like calcium oxide, this is the most common. Magnesium oxide also will make it fluid, but not all basic oxides are equally effective in reducing the. Uh, the the viscosity of SiO2. In other words, the basicity of different oxides are different. So, we actually have a basicity scale of different oxides. Calcium oxide is high, Pg, MgO is not so strong a base, weaker bases are FeO, then there are even other oxides which are even weaker. There are many definitions of basicity. The commonest definition of basicity is CaO by SiO2. And very often you will see in pyrometallic as operation, they will say the slag is maintained with a basicity of so and so. There, there are modifications required of this if there are other oxides, CaO plus MgO by SiO2 is another definition commonly used in the industry. Some people say since MgO is not as effective as CaO, it should be written as two, two thirds. Some people say under certain conditions, the basicity index is best written as Al2O3 plus SiO2, etcetera, etcetera. So, in all pyrometrological operations, the operator wants to know what is the basicity of the slag or is often advised about the basicity of slag, because proper basicity defines proper viscosity of slag. So, the viscosity of slag, which is a crucial parameter in pyrometallurgical operations, depends on temperature, because the higher the temperature, lower will be the viscosity, no matter what slag is it, because at higher temperatures bonds tend to break and the other will be basicity. So, temperature should be high, basicity should be high to lower viscosity or increase fluidity. There are also some fluidizing agents like calcium fluoride which when added uh, increases fluidity of slag. Now, slag basicity control is very important in the industry and there is a common saying that in many pyrometrical operations, the aim is to look at the slag. If the slag is right, the metal would be right. This was particularly so for blast furnace operation. In blast furnace, you have a slag layer covering the metal layer and the slag layer is has many functions. First of all, it is covering the metal layer that is whatever gaseous atmosphere is there on top of the slag is away from the metal. Between slag and metal all kinds of slag metal reactions are taking place depending on the uh, chemistry of the slag. So, the slag chemistry and slag properties are of vital importance. A simple example, I have to go for that to um, iron and steel. Perhaps you know that one of the problems of slags in blast furnace was because of alumina, high alumina that came from iron ores 
Indian roads are very good, but alumina comes from more as well as some from coke and Indian slags used to be very highly viscous because of Al2O3 content. Many efforts have been made to remove Al2O3 from iron ore, but it is very difficult. So, it will end up with slag with a lot of alumina, high viscosity. Many efforts were there to find out how to bring down this Al2O3 content. You cannot simply go on adding a lot of calcium oxide increase the basicity that will increase the uh, volume of slag and increasing the basicity will also have effect on slag metal reactions. Finally, the adverse effect of Al2O3 was met by adding MGO and many blast furnace operations were found to be optimum with addition of 9 percent MGO that took care of high alumina in the slag which was going to increase the basicity, so the viscosity, viscosity was brought down by MGO. Now, why I am saying these things is that you often come across terms like basic slag, neutral slag, acid slag. Generally, by basic slag, it will mean CaO by SiO2 more than 2. MO in this case CaO by SiO2 neutral slag will be 2, acid slag will mean CaO by SiO2 less than 2. I am writing CaO in, the, in case there is MgO that has to come here again. So, you can say MO by SiO2, basic oxides and acid oxide, their ratio governs the basicity, neutrality, or acidity of slag. I think with that, it is time to wind up this lecture. I have mainly discussed here the use of Ellingham diagrams to understand reduction of oxides by carbon and reduction of oxides by metals which form more stable oxides. I have talked about calcination, roasting, smelting and when we talked about smelting I mentioned that in smelting, you have to have a slag phase in contact with either a metal phase or a matte phase. A matte phase is not a metal phase, it is a mixture of sulphides. But when you have a slag, the first criterion for the slag must be that it should be fluid, that it should be easily taken out it should be easily tapped out, it should separate out very easily from the metal phase. So, we have liquid liquid separation. Sometimes it is also important to control the chemistry of the slag, just making it fluid is not enough. It should have such a chemical composition that some reactions that are favorable to produce a purer metal are possible. Like maybe the composition will be such that it will the slag phase will absorb sulphur or phosphorus and other things that you do not want in the metal phase. So, not only fluidity is important, but chemistry is also important, but slag phase is a vital phase and slag chemistry, physical properties of the slag, they form a very important part of pyrometallurgical operations. I think I will end the lecture on pyrometallurgical reactions right now. In the next lecture, I will move into hydrometallurgy, 
and try to discuss some of the basic principles of hydrometallurgy. Thank you.